Hello, my name is Ashley. Hello, I'm Chris. This is our podcast we're doing. Thank you very much for listening. Chris, do you want to tell them a little bit about what we are actually doing with this? Yeah. So each week we're going to be uh, replaying a game from our youth. I was going to say classic game, but they might not be classic games. They might uh, be games. They may what? Dad, that's not, not, not swear. Come on. Why? Make it PG. Are we not supposed to swear? No, that's bad. Okay, so we should, probably should have covered that before we started. Yeah. Uh, so each week, one of us is going to choose a game from our youth, and we're going to present it to the one. I say this is a game that I liked, and then we're going to discuss it, share it, talk about any amusing anecdotes about it, and then we're going to have a go actually playing the game, and then afterwards reflect on the game because actually it might not be very good. Yeah, I was just going to pick you up on that. You said games that we liked. Not all of the games I've got are games that I liked. They're just games that I had. Surely you've bought a game that you have then decided that is is just terrible. Like Stardew Valley. Like you, you haven't bought Stardew Valley. <laughs> I've bought Stardew Valley, and you hate it. But everybody that's listening is now telling you how brilliant Stardew Valley it is. It wasn't. So. It was like a cult. You were just talking at me for so long about. How I amazing... was talking at you. Yeah, telling about how amazing this game was, and it was not. It was really dull. Anyway, so I like that because I don't want people to hate me. The cause... game that I'm thinking of from my childhood that I did not like but I owned and played obsessively was Little Nemo in Dreamworld. Do you ever play Little I've Nemo? Heard of it. It was based on a comic book. But I didn't know that at the time. Is it was French. It might have been. I don't know. Belgium. We'll, we'll look it up we'll when we actually up. cover it. Yeah. But when we go back to it. But the game, it consisted of you were this little boy in his pajamas, and he would he would go into his dreams, and he would encounter in various different places in his dreams. Like the first level, I think, is the woods, and he encounters these animals. His weapon was candies, little sweets wrapped up, right. and he could throw sweets at these animals. And if he threw three, they sort of fell to sleep, and he could become them. So um, like Kirby, I, sort of. More like Space Station Silicon Valley. Yeah. You know that one? Yeah. So a bit more like that. The first animal that you came across was a frog. So then you became frog. Sort it's of like, like Odyssey. Odyssey. Yeah. Hey, there we go. The second one was a mole, and he could dig underground. Okay, yeah. pretty cool. That sounds all but right. But we're not here to talk about little... little we're not. Neighbor. We're not here to talk about little... We're here to talk about your game. <laughs> My game. <laughs> Which is... Because we tossed a coin beforehand and I'm the lucky person who gets to go first. So for episode one of our podcast, the game we are playing is Toe Jam and Earl 2. <sighs> You must have suspected that. No, I didn't. Really? I, I Before we started recording, I did say to you that I had had a little five minute go of Soleil. Yes. Which is known as Crusader of Senti. Even though it was called Soleil. Even though it was called... Yeah, I imagine it's probably like an American, yeah. European thing. So Soleil in Britain, Crusader of Senti. Soleil possibly being in, the sun, in just, America. Just in case you, you, you weren't aware of that. Ah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, very intelligent. Yep. Interjection. <laughs> thank you. I, yeah, so I, I thought it was actually going to be that. So I did a little bone <laughs> up on it. I had Unnecessary five boning up. Yeah, so I now I feel cheated. Yep, sorry. So, Toe Jam and Earl. Toe Jam and Earl 2. 2. Yeah, so why Toe Jam and Earl 2? So, I was a Mega Drive boy back in the day. I loved platformers. It would be really obvious to go for the first episode, I'd go for one of the Sonics, because I yeah. used to play that obsessively. I used to lust after the Mario's something chronic, and again, that'd be quite obvious to go for one of them. So I thought and you were very pleased to see Mario's nipples in Mario Odyssey as a result, weren't you? Oh, in the swimsuit. L- lusting after Mario oh, for yes. your whole life, and then, and then there is he gets his nipples out, and you're out. just over the top. Oh, that was... <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, um, nah, you should see his face now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. So I want to go for a platformer that's as much as Sonic that I did play a lot and got a lot of enjoyment out yeah. of. And there were lots. There was one called... Which I'm sure we'll come to. Oh, probably, yeah. yeah. There was a British one called... I can't remember the developer off the top of my head called Rollo's the Rescue. You played that like event. It. it was all about uh, woodland creatures. That was really good as well. But I decided to go for, for Toe Jam and Earl 2. Toe Jam and Earl 2 then, no. as I understand it, because I've seen a little bit about it. Yep. I haven't played it fully, but I've played little bits of it. It's not actually... From what I've seen... And it's partly seeing you play it as well. It's not a proper platformer. I don't know how to what say it. What earth do you mean by that? Well, isn't it sort of isometric? No, it's Toe Jam 01. That's Toe Jam 01. Yeah. Right, okay. So Toe Jam 01 was an isometric... Um, I was like, puzzler, but it's not a puzzler. It's like an isometric platform almost, I suppose. I, I'll be honest, I don't know much about it because... After mm-hmm. loving Toe Jam 2, I then tried playing Toe Jam 1 and did not like it at all. Oh, right, okay. As I know recently, there was a Toe Jam 3 for the Xbox, I think, back in like 2001, 2002, possibly. No, wasn't that more recent than that? Didn't no, it and there was out? another one oh, that's right. come out recently. Uh, is it the Back in the Groove? Yes. Yeah. And it's out for the Switch, isn't it? Which is on the Switch. And yeah. I do want to play that because of how much I love Toe Jam 2. However, it is very much enthralled to Toe Jam 1. So not your cup of tea necessarily. Not necessarily. Toe Jam 2, solid platformer. 
number. What I think would be interesting with this new one yep. is if it, even if it is in thrall, as you say, to the first one, surely it's going to have learnt from the past 25 or 30 years of uh, development. Yes, um, quite possibly. And so it might actually be a good game? It might be, but the genre just didn't sit well with me for whatever reason. No, okay. Fussy child. You've chosen Toe Jam and Ale. Two. Two. Apologies. You've chosen Toe Jam and Ale two. Did you own Toe Jam and Ale two? Yes. Right. Panic on Funk Control. Panic on Funk Right. Good. So, Toe Jam and Ale 2, Panic on Funk Control. Yep. You had it. It was yours. Yes. How did that come about? How did you get hold of that? I think Santa emptied his Santa. sack under my tree. <sighs> Okay. Was that crude? Did you not like that? No, I didn't. You told me not to say swear words, and then you <laughs> and just I, then I did a talked bad. about Santa's <laughs> under your tree. Explicitly saying, mm. but you did though, didn't you? It was more explicit in the in the thinking about it, which I did too much of there. Yeah, thank you very much. You got it for Christmas, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. What sort of reaction that. did you have? Yeah, I was like, yes, no, the Mega Drive game. I was, I was very chuffed with it. And was that it? You well, got the Mega Drive game, and you went, oh, thank you, Papa. It's a very nice game. I'll uh, have a go after dinner. Thank you very much. <laughs> not not far off, actually. <laughs> I can just, I can genuinely just imagine what it was like at your house on Christmas. <laughs> well, or you the... didn't go mad. You didn't. You weren't like well, jumping the around. Art, the, the box art is just like it, it's the two aliens. And you didn't know what Adel. the game was. No, it's like no, just okay. picture them running. It's not like I didn't know any. I didn't have any context of it. I didn't really know what it was. It just no. kind of for Christmas, and my birthdays, growing up, I lost the games we got for for presents. It was often second hand ones. Yeah. So I didn't really know much about it. And it wasn't like I, I wrote to Bigness to Santa saying I want this game, this game, this game. So it was a complete surprise. So I got it. Yeah. I'm like oh, okay, that cool. A game and so I played and I was I was hooked. Toe Jam and Elle is, is so, like a. Oh. Toe Jam and Ale, the franchise, mate. Yep, sorry. It is actually quite a well-regarded franchise. Like, people remember it fondly, don't yeah. they? Yeah. And that's the reason that we've had these new versions of the game. Yes, I suppose so. The question that I've got is, did your mum and dad know what they were doing when they bought you it? Or was it nah. just like a freak accident? No, no, they just wandered into uh, Electro's Boutique, as it was back in the day. Right. Uh, and we've picked that up. I remember once, I know I've told you this story before, I remember um, for Christmas, oh, what would have been like 95 or something, my little brother got Sonic 1 for Christmas. And Electronics Boutique used to do the pre-owned section and used to mark on the games on the manuals on the cartridges a P for pre-owned. And my brother you know, got this present from Santa, opened it up and opened up Sonic and it had a P in the corner for pre-owned. And I was probably about nine or ten or something. I said to my dad, oh, it says P on. Why is that? My dad said, quite quick thinking actually, said, oh, I must have been meant for someone called Peter and Santa delivered it to the wrong house, <laughs> trying to sort of cover his tracks. It was only years later I kind of realised, oh, actually, it was pre-owned. pre-owned. No, Would you have been bothered? No, uh, no not, not at all. No. I had a bit of a, a sour experience with pre-owned console. Did you know about that? I might have told you. Is this the one you off 20 quid or something? No, no, no. That, was, story from the that was something else. That was 20p. Oh, 20p. Yeah, sorry. and that was a Mega Drive. That was the, yeah. the only Mega Drive that I owned. I bought for 20p. Yeah. And it wasn't me that drove the bus. The bargain. I didn't drive the price down. I was offered it, and the the price that I was given was twenty p. Didn't even <laughs> for a Mega Drive. Yeah, for a Mega Drive with games, and one of the games was uh, Sonic and Knuckles three. Oh you could my put the days. the other cartridges in the top. I uh, has you mean Sonic and Knuckles? Sorry, Sonic and Knuckles. Come yeah, on. and it came with Beavis and Butthead as well. Premiership Manager, maybe ninety five or ninety seven. But if you put the different cartridges in, the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge yeah. had different effects on yes on different cartridges. You could like do cheats on Beavis and Butthead. Really? Yeah. Did you not know that? No. No. And you could... Was I, it you I'm could play sure. Sonic? I'm not sure about that. Honestly. Yeah. No. True. No, it is. It's true. That was the thing where it's like you put Sonic 3 in and it made Sonic 3 and Knuckles this huge epic. Yeah. You put Sonic 2 in and you could play through Sonic 2 as Knuckles, which was really cool. Yeah. And I'm not sort of... Like, I remember climbing around as Knuckles, climbing around the chemical plant zone and found this uh, ring box that was tucked away really high. So obviously kind of they'd retroactively, retrospectively, sorry, programmed it in to kind of be something accessible for Knuckles. Right. Which you could climb up there, which I thought was really clever. Yeah. And then as far as I understood it, any other game, you just put it in and it opened up that Blue Spheres game where you could... Well, the way that I remember it, and I'm I'm fully accepting that I might have misremembered this, yeah. but I, I remember testing all the games that right. we had, because it was, it was my cousin that sold me it for 20p, and while I was staying at his house at the time, and we tested all the games in the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge, and some of them had th- different things happen, so it wasn't just a case of you put any other cartridge in and you just got a generic, whatever, Blue Spheres game, 3D Sonic thing. It was that it did different things. So was it doing Beavis and Butthead then? I can't remember, but I will like I you, could, you could play Beavis and Butthead as Knuckles. No, you can't do that, but that would have been amazing. <laughs> that would have been, been amazing. Oh, I wish they thought of that. But right. it was, I, I'm sure it was that you could do like it unlock cheats or something like that. Right. 
Right. But I, we'll find out. We'll find out after we record this. That came out of me saying about a sore experience with a PlayStation. A second-hand PlayStation 2, it was. It was... I can't remember what year, but we'd gone out. My mum wanted to get me a PlayStation, but she didn't know what she was doing. And at this point, I was a teenager, and so I knew about Santa. You know, he ceased to be. So my mum took me to town and asked me to help her choose which console to get. Because we weren't, we weren't that well off, and we needed to sort of save a bit of money, so we were right. going for second hand. So we found one. It was from that game station. Do you remember game station? Yeah, they were the ones that, like, it was like game, but more edgy, wasn't it? They thought they were more, more edgy. Trendy. What I found was or that they were more sneery and miserable. Trendy. And the guy sort of, he gave us a console. It was unboxed, and I got some games. I think I got, that was the year that I got Final Fantasy X, actually. Excellent. Yes, very good game to get for Christmas. And I can't remember the other games because it was a bit fixated on that. Oh, Tony Hawk's 3. That was the other one. Excellent. Yeah. Ash and I discussed Tony Hawk's recently about how he remembers them quite fondly. I remember them not quite so fondly. So maybe for a a future We'll certainly get to that, yeah. Oh, definitely. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Tony Hawk's 3 was very good well, there's another story about that but we will save it I think for the Tony Hawk's episode maybe to. yeah so we bought this console we had assumed I think that it had been checked and then it came to Christmas Day I know stupid uh, it came to Christmas Day I knew what I was getting excited about it came down early unwrapped it unwrapped all the other presents right. quite fast to try and get to the point where I could play it plugged it all in in the dining room so I wasn't disturbed by other people yep. wanting the telly and it didn't work didn't turn on <laughs> Uh, what a sad Christmas it was, day. It was sadder than you think because it wouldn't turn on. I was dismayed, absolutely dismayed, because every single present pretty much that I'd been brought... Related to the PS2. Yeah. Yeah. My mum had been round the houses to my nana and, and my aunties and things and said he's getting a PlayStation 2. These are a few things that he might like for it. All the peripherals. Yeah. He dance Memory mats. cards. Memory no, yeah. no, unfortunately, no, no dance mat. Oh, I've yeah. got some nice images for you as a, as a nipper. I bet you have. Little jig. <laughs> And I wasn't a nipper. I was a 14-year-old boy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, with the danglies. Just, is that what you're thinking about? You, you need danglies? Yeah. What do you mean, danglies? Jo- jobbing about as I dance on the dance mat. <laughs> like that. I wasn't, but now I find that somewhat haunting image. Yeah. Sort of, uh, Sorry about that. Stuck in my mind. <laughs> yeah, so it wouldn't work. All the stuff that I'd been given for Christmas was to do with it, except for a, a CD. And the CD was Bowling for Soup. <laughs> oh, crikey. So, my that, Christmas... That states us, us yeah. and our ages somewhat. Yes, yeah, so now it? you know how old we are. I'd got a Bowling for Soup album and that, right. and then a load of PlayStation stuff for a PlayStation that didn't work. And the shops were obviously closed. My mum had got some infrared wireless headphones. So my Christmas day was sat in the living room <laughs> with the rest of my family with these wireless headphones on, listening to Bowling oh for Soup God. on repeat. <laughs> Being like a, sad. It's like a Dickens novel, isn't it? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I'm glad that you, you said that. Because <laughs> if I'd said that, it would have come across I do, I do feel quite, really badly. quite mean deriving such amusement from that sad story. But uh, uh, I like, told you, yeah. Just you sat there listening to Bowling for Soup. It was the Did worst. Did you close your eyes as well just to really focus in so on So that I could be the like sounds. at the gig. No, so, no, or just or to like, let them heighten your senses. Let the world fade away, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, like pretend that it wasn't happening. I love the like the idea of your family sort of go along with it as well, just like you sat there. Yeah, I th- my mum was absolutely gutted. I can like, imagine she was so disappointed on my behalf. She used to bring it up years later. Do you remember that Christmas? And I'd say, yeah, I remember the Christmas. The bowling for soup. We Christmas. don't need to talk about it. <laughs> the time we bowled for soup. But she would a face when she would bring it up. She looked mm. so so unhappy. What like happened a, then? Did, did you take it back and get a... the next open day? Right. So it wasn't Boxing Day. Either, I don't. It oh. might have been Boxing Day actually. Maybe it was Boxing Day, but we took it yeah, back up the earliest opportunity right? and swapped it. And my mum said, to hell with saving the money, you're getting a brand new one. Right. And she bought me a brand new one. And I, she shouldn't have done, really. But she was mortified. Genuinely, yeah. it was like the biggest parenting mess up that she felt she'd ever made, I think. So, yeah, that, that was my Christmas misery. Why are we talking about that? So, you asked me about... When my parents had checked to jump no. Oh, yeah. Wait, and yeah. I always had the feeling they just kind of wandered into, or my dad probably wandered into a trans booty, kind of rifled through the pre-owned bits and... That looks zany. Well, I'm not so zany. I would also, I would think probably based on price, mm. uh, what the cheapest ones were, <clears throat> and went from there. I always felt Toe Jam and Earl, it felt quite at odds with my upbringing. And it's very much a, it's that sort of California dude sort of vibe, yeah. isn't it? And it's, um, no, it's all about hip hop and stuff. And I was a very middle class boy growing up in, in the sticks. It, 
None of the kind of... Yeah, but think, you were a middle-class bit... boy growing up in the sticks yeah. in the 90s. In the 90s, and yeah. And that is the... Con- that's all the context you need to explain everything that you just said. Yeah, because I was about to say, like, you had stuff like that was Saved by the Bell. I yep. Saved by the Bell. So it was it was pumped at us, wasn't it? Yeah, it that was. was. Rude Dog was on the television. And do you remember Rude Dog? It was like a Nickelodeon... Rude Dog? That rings a bell. So I didn't have Nickelodeon. I didn't have Sky Tally, so... Uh... No, neither did we. But yeah, in oh, the, the 90s, 90s, the 90s, the 90s vibe. The sort of the, the, the bright colours and the yeah eye popping dark and, gaudy yeah um, I recently saw in in a clothes shop when I was out shopping my wife saw a, a t-shirt that I really liked and she said no it's saved by the bell it was that sort of like that weird like turquoisey sort of light Something bluish colour yeah exactly it had little black dots over it some pink panels some yeah. yellow panels I thought it was quite nice my wife said no and I'm she was surprised. probably right in retrospect yeah she probably was but I think that we're moving into a sort of a 90s throwback period we- so I felt that it just didn't really speak to me that much but the gameplay itself did I, it, I don't know it just felt very alien for want of a better word Bum-bum-sh. Bum-bum-sh. that was an intentional I get a bit of yeah. there. On a, a, alien to your life I, I, I think playing it back now as we all do presently I feel that it might be quite cringy playing it back really yeah I think it might feel a bit too try hard and I, I, know I what think you're now playing it as a 30 something middle class boy I think it might be a bit mm, it's not enough of a BBC4 box Box it for me. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm I'm hoping that that's not the case, to be honest. I hope you're not, because that's um, really snobby. It, <laughs> yeah, but that is just who you are now. Oh, yeah, Garden reader. Garden. <laughs> you say that it felt very alien, but actually you, you enjoyed it a lot. That's oh, yeah, definitely. Because the, yeah, the gameplay is solid. So that's was what's... solid. Yeah, Are you was, expecting yeah. it to still be? Um, I remember replaying it when I was at university in about 2005. Again, okay. that will ages. I remember there's these these bonus levels that you go into. There's these items you have to collect for a character called the Funkopotamus, I believe. That was done quite well in the game. This is all the aliens talk about this kind of this mythical being that's sort of, you know, really like it's all powerful and whatever, called the Funkopotamus, and then you meet it as this tiny little creature with huge eyes. It's orange, I seem to remember. <laughs> and that's quite funny in itself. Yeah. And the the Funkopotamus sent you off on this task to go and collect like a bit of a you know items. I remember like a jar of pickles and there was some Sneakers, or again, quite sort of sneakers, 90s not sneakers, famous. exactly. But you can only get them again. If I remember this right, you can only get them through any these bonus levels. And I remember there was one that I missed because I was, you know, very much was and very much still am. Sort of, if I'm playing a game, I want to get everything absolutely can do out of it. Mm. And you couldn't then go back and replay that level. Well, you maybe could, and maybe I just missed how to do Don't it. Know how. I remember that bugging me when I replayed it sort of about that would be about 15 years ago when I did that. But I think in terms of it being a platformer, I remember it being a, a solid platformer and the, the sort of the hook of it being that you had to catch all the humans and each human had a different kind of, you know, this human did this thing, but this human did this thing in a different way. And it was all very much a bit of strategy element yeah. to it as well, rather than just a, like a Sonic, just get to the end of the level as, as quickly as you can. Or yeah. Whatever. But there were different elements. I remember a, a, almost like a rock band esque, well, not rock band, but like a, a rhythm action game anyway. We had to press buttons right, okay. to be given hip hop beats, which again, I feel might date it if we play it back. Why would that date it? We, it's it's that very much that kind of like Della Soul kind of, yeah, like oh, right, sort okay. of like smooth yeah. hip hop. Okay. That sort of so stuff. So it's not the rhythm game type No, stuff no, just gonna... the actual music style. Yeah, cool. The question that I was going to ask you was whether it actually was conscious of itself. Was it tongue in its cheek or was Ooh. it genuinely trying to be cool? I feel that it was genuinely trying to be cool. Yeah. I find that games that try to put their tongue in their cheek somewhat, you have to do it well yes. and consistently to pull it off. Like, I know you and I have spoken recently about ukulele, yeah. which I tried on the Switch, and it tried to do that, but it didn't do it enough. And the times it did do it then made itself, in my opinion, it just sounded really awkward and uncomfortable. Mm. I just didn't think it hung together. There were lots of other problems with ukulele as well that probably compounded those there were. issues. But I don't want to, you know, no, I don't, I don't want that. to throw shade on ukulele. Oh, no, I do. I was... think it deserves it. No, because people put blood, sweat and tears into that game. We're going to we're gonna absolutely slam some games, I'm sure. Well, we'll do it in a nice way. Will we? I will. <laughs> I don't think you will. Constructive criticism. Right, okay. So if they listen to it. Yeah, I don't want to get people hating on me. Okay. It, I mean, I'm going to be, I'm going to be quite interested. I don't mind people hating on you. You might. neither do I. No, exactly. I'm not really bothered. It will be interesting to see if the game does have any tongue in any of its cheeks, because for the most part, I think that games in the '90s they were trying to catch on to cool. Cool was like the cat, the what do they call it? The I can't remember what it was, but 
it was the point of everything in the 90s. Like, everyone was trying to be cool, you know? Like, it was a bit too earnest as well, like, tr- like just trying a bit too hard. And that, everyone was doing I think that, about so. cool spots. Yes, exactly. Oh, a, yeah. a game based around a part of the, was it the 7-Up logo? Yeah, the 7-Up logo. Like, what's that about? Why did that become a game? Exactly. I mean, that, that was cool? the other Couldn't you be, I don't know, prurient spot or something like that? <laughs> That was the other side of the 90s that was, it defined the period, I think, because we were getting into an era of like branding overload. Yes. I mean, they've, they've become a lot smoother for, for all of their foibles. Branding these days is a lot better, frankly, than it was was in the 90s. Couched into itself, isn't it? Like, mm. do you ever play? Was it Mick and Mac the game? Yeah, the that? McDonald's game. Oof. Yeah, exactly. Everyone was trying to do this, and actually, the game that we're going to be talking about next week is part of this whole thing. The console gaming industry in the nineties was all based around money. It was based around money, but the whole way that they were trying to get money was to try and make a character out of themselves. Yes. So we had Mario. Mario was the the first and the best in my view. That's right. Um, mascot yeah yeah but then we had then we had sonic who was hot on his heels literally but he was actually part of a much larger push because if you go back to the sega mass system they were already trying to compete with mario on the sega mass system with, with, alex, mascot, kid. with alex kid yeah. exactly so then in 1991, sort of 1990 to 1991, 92, there were a slew of, of different mascots. And actually then that carried on later on into the 90s. So you, your PlayStation comes out and you've got one of the first things to sort of make it an icon was, was Crash Bandicoot. Yeah. And Tomb Raider, and they were all based. They were basing everything around these characters. Tomb Raider less so with the cool aspect of it. Less so with the cool. Well, well actually, actually, let's, let's rephrase that because Lara Croft, I suppose, was cool. Yeah, but she wasn't adult. She wasn't that kind of. The, the point I'm making is, it's that kind of the the overtly cool. Like, and going back yeah. to what you said about Sonic, Sonic was deliberately designed to be as cool as possible. Yeah, exactly. It? Yeah, like like a genetic mutant made in the lab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. H- how do we make him more cool? So sure yeah, everything cool. everything was based around how cool can you make yourself. Yeah, exactly. And and actually, when you look back at it, a hell of a lot of it wasn't cool. Was Saved by the Bell, just to go back to there, was Saved by the Bell, was it the 80s or was it the 90s? I would say that was like the late, uh, sorry, the early 90s, but I think I was too young. I remember being on Channel 4 and just not being into it at all. Oh, I love it. Because I was probably a bit too young. And I'm younger than you. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Too mature, too grown up for it. Me or you? Me, obviously. Maybe, maybe, yeah. It's like Fresh Prince Bel Air. Never got into it. Oh, I love that as well. Yeah, wow. Well. They both they're very nineties. They're exactly. both very nineties things, and they were all about like two, literally two cool for school. Yeah. In, uh, Saved by the Bell's case, again, it carried on all the way through. So they they were sort of certainly Saved by the Bell was like Nickelodeon. Yeah. The nineties watchword was cool. Never heard of it. What watchword? Yeah. That's no. A that's watch a watchword is the thing that everything revolves around. Oh, I thought it was like a TV program. No, <laughs> no, no, no. The nineties watchword right. was. Cool. I mean, buzzword. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah, buzzword. But buzzword is... Is, is what everyone else would say. No, it's not what Yeah, you, you don't say watchword. Watchword and buzzword are slightly different, no. but I'm not going to try and define them on, on the podcast. We'll do that <laughs> off, air. off air. Yeah, when we find out that I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah, air. if you like. Yeah, all right. What do you remember about the game? What what stands out in your memory of uh, uh, Play Jam Out 2? The things I've talked about, the, the Funkopotamus, the, the platform aspect, the sort of, I don't want to say puzzle, because it's not a puzzle game, but the, the strategy side of it almost, the, the catching the humans. I remember the bonus level being really abstract and really nicely presented, which again, I think maybe playing it back now, it might be a bit too try hard. I don't know. I remember it's got two player aspects. You could play as Toe Jam or you could play as Earl. I think you could play it by yourself and have the computer control the other character. I'm not sure about that. Mm. But you could definitely play it two players where, so one was Sojan, one was Earl. And I remember that being really fun, playing it on my little brother. Mm. I remember the sort of, the, the, the plot of it, that it was, it was trying to rid Funktron of all the, the humans. You end up going to space for some of it and you went out to the Funktron moon. And I remember those levels being really stark. I saw the ones like black and white and really like quiet because the rest of the game is really colourful. Are they like and later on levels or are we going yeah, to see yeah. those today? Yeah, Towards the end of the game. Okay. I sure it'd be just consistently fun. When I, when I get into a game, and this is still something I have now, it's all I want to play. I just, I, I just want to play that game all the time. Yeah. And I'm, that's, you know, I'm sure that's normal. And I remember Toe Jam 0 2 being one of the first games where I kind of like, 
I was really hooked on it and I would sit and play it after school for hours and hours. Uh, so maybe that's possibly one of the reasons why it's so special right? because it was something I was really into. I think there's a different explanation for that as well though. And I don't know if I've talked to you about this before about childhood gaming. Right. Um, but we're going to touch on this a lot because this podcast is uh, sort of, that's what the bread and butter is going to be. Um, sort of delving back into our childhoods. One of the reasons that you will have got home and played in that fashion was because that was one of the only games you had. Yeah. And I, I was the same. So I, we talked... Did did we talk about Little Nemo at the beginning of this? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we so stream that. Um, It'd be ironic if you had. I didn't really like Little Nemo. I think I'd probably like it more now. One of the reasons was because I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't have the instruction book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just to add another stroke to that sorry picture. Of- <laughs> but that's a different. That's a different time <laughs> area. It all adds up. <laughs> but- We'll come to that. We'll come to that when we discuss that or any game that I own. Wasn't there another story about a game that you you consistently pawned? (laughs) Yeah. We'll come to that as well. (laughs) I don't know. I told you about that. Yeah, no. Thinking of Linus from Snoopy. I'm going to have to... We're, we're, I'll tell you about that another day. Okay. I'll tell them about that another day. But yeah, Little Nemo I didn't like, but I would play it on a regular basis because I only owned, at the time, three or four games. So if I got really bored of another one, I had to play one of the others, and it would have to be Little Nemo at times. Because it was what well, was there. Yeah. No, I, I sort of plough through it, and I'd complete Tage Jump 2, and then it'd be like, right, it's the next one. And the idea of completing a game when I was a child was like... Why? Because they were really hard. They were like exceedingly. Better. Yeah, I should get good. But have there. you ones that you found easy when you were little? If there were any, have you ever tried playing them? Have you ever tried playing them recently? Ones that I found easy, like so. For example, I went three years ago to the National Video Game Museum in Nottingham, where it has now moved to Sheffield. And they had the Jungle Book game on the Game Gear. It all sort of you to play. And mm. I used to play that in the platformer. I couldn't get past the first level. No. Well, that and was my experience, experience as a child for most games. I experience with Vector Man on the Mega Drive. Tried replaying that recently. Couldn't get past the first boss. Because right. you've got rubbish. Possibly elements of that. But I think games were just generally harder. They were harder. They were a lot harder. But that, that wasn't good game design. It, it was often that the, that the game was obfuscated by poor choices. So an example of that, and again, this is a game that we're going to maybe talk about in the future because it's one of my three games that I had at the same time as Little Nemo. Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, right. was one of the games that I owned. Second hand, no instruction book. Brilliant. Uh, this is your theme here. <laughs> yeah. All of the games on the NES that I owned. It was the NES version because there are lots of versions of Home Alone 2, which is a lesser version of the SNES version. The first level right. is set. Have you seen the film? Yeah. So he goes to the he goes to Tim Curry's hotel. Yeah. And Tim Curry's mad because he's using a credit card. And in the game, Tim Curry's ringing up his mates and saying, "Hey, you need to catch his kid. He's a little bugger." And you have to. Jump. I can see why that didn't happen in the film. You have to jump over bellboys. You have to. Uh, ju- you have to slide. You know, he does that knee slide. Don't remember the film. Okay. Well, in the, in the film, he does a knee slide. Right. Uh, I can't remember when exactly he does a knee slide. But that is like is it when he's avoiding bell boys? Huh? Is it when he's avoiding bell boys? Probably. In the film? I, I feel like he might do it in the first film as well, but I can't remember. And then they brought all those bell boys in the first film. All those bell boys. Yeah, yeah. All those grannies jumping up and down with their uh, umbrellas as well. <laughs> There's a big fat man that comes and tries to grab you out of a shop in the hotel that you are is the first level. It's rubbish. You'll it see. Sounds it sounds terrible. It is. It is bad. But at the so end of the level, people trying to catch a boy in a city. So to remind people, because I have been been going on about this without actually getting to the point. It's fine. The point was games were harder. Yes. And they weren't harder because they were difficult. They were harder because bad game design choices obfuscated the point of what you're trying, what you're meant to do. You get to the end of the first level, this hotel lobby in Home Alone Two, and there are two lifts, and there's also a third door that is sliding up and open and closed. And out of that third door is a flying suitcase. It's like someone's throwing them at you. Right. And I always got to that point. It's the first level. I always got to that point and I had no idea what I had to do because you could you could slide into the suitcases and knock them out, but you couldn't get into the door that kept opening. Because you're not going one of the lifts? Because you're not going one of the lifts? You could go up one of the lifts. Right. So how would you do that? Going up to him, pressing it up. So that's one thing that I tried. Right. Didn't work. Press the button. Press the button. Like literally press the button. To yeah. Press the button for the game. In so the you game. press the button, yeah, in the yeah. game. So there's a button between the two lifts. Yeah. And if you press the button, it lights up. Right. But it doesn't stay lit up like a normal lift. Right. So I press the button. You have to stand on a little um, a little bin to reach the button. <laughs> Just like in real life. Yeah. And you press the button and the lifts don't open. Right. So what do you do next? I've got no idea. No, exactly. And I wasn't a 34-year-old man or whatever you are. How old are you? 33. 
33, 34, 33, whatever. Yeah. I was a 31 or 33 year old man trying to solve this puzzle. I was a five year old, six year old boy. You had to continuously press the button while avoiding the suitcases. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, exactly. I think you had to press it about 30 times. Have you played the game recently? I played it recently because I'm doing something and else. You with still it. had to, you, that was. What I had you to just, look it up. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and that's not even the end of the level. So I wasn't getting to the end of the level and then getting not, uh, frustrated and having to stop. I was getting halfway through the first level and going, I don't know. And I suppose, and I'm not going to say anything revolutionary by saying this, but nowadays, obviously, games, like, you can save mid-level, you can save yeah, exactly. it and turn it to standby and whatever. Mm. We didn't have that, did we? No. If you were on a Mickey Mania, for example, was another platformer on the Mega Drive that I played a lot, and there was a level I always get to right at the end, not the first level, like you, and I could always get to that level and then never get any further, but it would take me, like, an hour to get to that level, yeah. and then died, oh, that's it, game over. Yeah. Did you ever just leave your console on, surely, or did you not do that? No, because I, I get to that level in particular that I'd struggle with. I'd have one life left. I'd try doing it. And you died. Straight away, okay, and so it wasn't over. a case of, like, no, you got no. to that level and... But then it's then, like, I've now got to play it for an hour again to get to that point again, which I did do multiple times because I did really enjoy yeah. that game. But nowadays, you just need to start the level... You save I'm, it. I'm quite envious of you because you keep saying that you enjoyed the games that you had when you were a kid. And yes. I, I went. Ironically, that's, that's, that's not ironic at all. It's just, it's, it's, I just don't understand why you have games that you wouldn't enjoy. Because you go into a shop sure. and you see Home Alone 2 Lost in New York and you think, bloody hell, that's going to be good, isn't it? You're a six year old boy. <laughs> you love Home Alone. Therefore, the game must be good. Yeah. You, you, you've not been stunned that's how by they that. get you. How every single film game. It didn't terrible. stop me playing it. Apart from the Mega Drive platformers. Yeah, and there are a few others, but we can yeah, talk about Yeah, a handful, those but yeah. as a general rule... As a general rule, yeah, they aren't Games good. of films. And, and films of games. Film, exactly, mm. films of games. But it didn't stop me playing it, and that's what I'm saying. Games were hard, and games yep. were bad. Yeah. But we still yeah. played them. Yeah. Obsessively, in, in a lot of cases. At least my case. Whereas Toe Jam Roll 2, as hopefully. I remember it, was good. And it's hopefully good now. And Cause I'm it wasn't gonna hard, play it. It, was just, it was just fun. Knock about mm. fun. Good clean fun. We are going to go away. We're going to have a little go on, on Toe Jam Roll 2. I have never played it. I've seen it. So it's going to be my first experience of it. And then we're going to come back and tell you what we think. So, Ashley, now that you have played Toe Jam Mill 2, what do you think of it? Uh, I like it. There you go. <laughs> go go quite nice. Down the, down the line, straight end of, down end the line. End of podcast, you like Yeah, it. there you go. <laughs> okay, what do you like about it? It was, we've said this off tape, off tape. Oh, that's very 90s as well, isn't it? It is. I think, I think it's taken me back. Yeah. It's a very good example of a Mega Drive platformer, for one. It's got that colourful palette that you expect from... Yes. From a Mega Drive platformer. We had to look uh, while we were off tape as well. We had a look at Mega Drive and SNES. We were talking about how the Mega Drive we felt was more colourful than SNES games. And turns out it, that was not true. In terms of colour palettes. Yes. In terms of displayable colours. Uh, there might be more technical uh, stuff that we don't quite understand. Because I'm sure, I'm sure I've, I've heard something about the reasoning behind why colours look the way they do on the Mega Drive is because of its... Superior color palettes, but I, and, and I don't blast know. processor. Not nothing to do with the blast processing. All to do with the blast processing. We, we didn't even have blast processing uh, in this country. It wasn't a part of the in my advertising. Head, it was every game was blast processed to within an inch of its life. It wasn't though, was it? Because <laughs> that wasn't part of our adverts. We didn't have that in our adverts. <laughs> Oh, but to go back to the series stuff, the the it was a it was a very cartoony aesthetic, and there are multiple games on the on the on the Mega Drive that have that kind of look to them. And when we were playing, we we likened it to um, sort of Rocco's Modern yeah. Life, and even going beyond that, Panic in Funkatron has actually got some links to Rocco's Modern Life in a visual sense. The the patterning on the menus and things yes. reminded me of the titles to, to Rocco's Modern Life or Ren and Stimpy that sort of animation I in terms of Rocco's Modern Life that was very much if I remember it rightly about sort of like, a bit like a slacker sort of character wasn't yeah. it yes and in my head Toe Jam 2 was musical and quite hip hop and it was but I also got the sense playing it again this evening that Toe Jam and themselves as characters are very much in that mould of slackers as well aren't yeah, they yeah they absolutely are yeah. the whole plot of it is oh 
we have accidentally brought these, these Earth things back to fun control. Yeah, bugging well, it up. We, we'd better go and save them because otherwise we're in trouble. But yeah. they're quite reluctant to do so. And I quite liked that. Me too. I know I keep saying that. It's going to end up being the catchphrase of this of this podcast. But Excellent. But it was very much of the of its time. It was the 90s yeah. uh, on screen. And, and that whole idea of the slacker was a thing that ran through the 90s as well. Definitely. Yeah. We spotted at the start as well the little kid mode, which yeah, from that the menu, was quite a surprise. We didn't actually know what it was, so we had to Google that. So little kid mode, and that's lil l i l, to just to keep it sort of fresh and and happening. Little kid mode was a mode <laughs> was, where was I supposed to laugh at that, Chris? No, I just felt very <laughs> uh, self conscious. L- little kid mode, hip and fresh and happening. And happening. <laughs> yeah. You you sound like an old man in the nineties trying to be hip and fresh and happening, <laughs> which is very much how I felt playing the game back in the day. What as so, a boy? <laughs> as a boy, yeah, I thought right. he wasn't talking to me. But anyway, little kid mode, L I L is where you play through the first five levels of the game with infinite lives. So a shortened version, but a more playable version, which we felt was something that in not those more, days... Not more playable, but forgiving, like completely forgiving, yeah. because you're completely invincible. And it's something that we don't think really was around in games in Certainly days. not that I know of. No, not so noticed. So I think that's to be to be applauded, certainly. It's to be applauded. And actually, I, I think as well, the game is quite a long game. We counted up at 18 levels, and each level has different sections as well. There, there can be sort of five or six sections to a level. So if you think about, you know, what, what I was, a five-year-old, not even that, I would, you know, I would have been five when this was released in 1993. So a five-year-old going into that game and having to wade through 18 levels in a sitting, it's almost certainly not going to happen. I remember it being massive in terms yeah. of playing it. I'm so, surprised you finished it. I really am. Well, they had a password system. They had a password system. So I remember the back of my manual had in pen written in down in Byron, like, you know, level three was this password, level yeah. four was this password. And then it was a, a random string of letters uh, all together. So it had that in, in its favour, which meant it could be played over multiple sittings, which, again, was something quite unusual for games then. Was it? Passwords were a very... Okay, I'll rephrase that. Maybe in, in the games that I played, I don't remember there being many games with passwords in. Can you think I think they were fairly ubiquitous in games pre-save. I can't remember, and I certainly didn't own any of them, but I think that the NES had some games where you could save to the cartridge. Oh, really? Yeah, the NES. Okay. So the Nintendo Entertainment System. Only, Thanks only a few, room. and I certainly didn't know. I was doing it for the people Just, listening. I wasn't because in case people listen to a game, we podcast. call it the NES. They call it the Famicom in America. Where? So if I say the NES, and they'd never heard that. Well, if we're going to sort of, we've been talking about Toe Jam LT being on the the Mega Drive. We at no point have referred to it as the Genesis. Yeah, but that's a more the NES is an acronym, and I didn't know that they would necessarily have heard it. Where this is not going to be fun to listen to, <laughs> but that is the reason that I. Um, well, that's the reason that I wasn't particular. I wasn't that's clarifying was for to. your benefit. I was clarifying for other people's benefit. Okay. Certainly, as well, if you think about, you know, like there might be young young people listening to this. The youth people young <laughs> wanted to listen to two thirty year olds talking about. Well, game. You know, when I was when I was the fourteen year old sat yeah. at Christmas wishing that I had a working PlayStation <laughs> with your infrared headphones and with my own red for with soup. For soup on. I was also interested in going back and. And try and old SNES games yeah. that I never got my hands on that was supposed to be very good. So, you know, there's probably, maybe, hopefully, a 13 year old on the other end of this uh, podcast in the same position thinking, oh, I'm going to go try Toe Jam and Earl. What, where were we? What were we talking about? So, we're talking about little kid mode. We also. Yes. Oh, it, the fact, because I actually was thinking about the little kid mode in a negative sense, that it cut the game down to five levels. But actually, I think it, it's a positive because you, yes. what they're doing is saying that this game is five levels. It still will be quite substantial based yes. on the size of the levels. And it's also making it finishable. A kid will go into that and they will be able to finish it and possibly finish it in one sitting. They're basically giving access to younger kids to that sense of achievement. Definitely. That, that a bite-sized chunk might of got. the game. Yeah. I, I think it's brilliant. I think I do. Having that mode in there is, is very Yeah, it's, it's forward thinking. Certainly, I've never heard of it. If anybody out there has heard of it, we will... Yeah, definitely be interested to hear. We would love to know if there were any equivalents in 1993 or earlier or, or later. What was the first little kid mode? What was the first easy access mode? It's We've got them everywhere now, though, haven't we? Yeah, exactly. I've got a four-year-old daughter. It's something that I've become more aware of recently on Switch games like on... Mario Kart 8 and Mario Odyssey have got modes that you can turn on to make it more playable for her and she loves playing those games with those on but it may- maybe it's been has been something that has been around but I just haven't 
really paid attention to it. I've noticed it when it's happened. That's the thing. I don't have a child to benefit from it. Yeah. But I do see it when it happens, and I and I do think it's a very good thing. It, certainly these days, when you pick up a 3D, say Mario Odyssey is a game that you enjoyed playing with your daughter. Yes. And it was one of the first games that she ever actually got into, like sat down and played. You know, am I right yeah, be, yeah because of that hand-holding aspect. Because there was the assist mode. Yeah, precisely. Without those... That sort of 3D platforming It's too game. complex. Exactly. Yeah. And it, I can imagine if that, if that's where we started, I mean, I'm sure we, mm. we probably would have got our heads around it eventually, but it would have been quite forbidding. Definitely. A very overwhelming if, as well. And in terms of, you know, my four-year-old daughter playing it, it's not a case of she can whiz through the whole game. It's, it's still very much a case of she can interact with it for five minutes at a time. Yeah. But it's having that five minutes at a time is still positive. And I think I'm right in saying that she comes back to it time and time again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And she wants to. She asks yes. for it. It's not like you are setting her down and trying to school her in games. It's that she is very engaged with it and wants So I think because the game, the way it's structured, it does the assist mode. It makes it rewarding and fun to mm. play. It's not a case of it's just difficult. It, it's... Yeah. She can play. She can access yeah, it. Yeah, it's removing some of the barriers that older, more skilled players definitely. would appreciate in order order to allow a younger, less experienced player yeah. to engage with it on the same level, actually, I would say, because she's still collecting the moon. She's still got to do the things that need to be done to to get the rewards. Yeah. It's just that it, it helps a little bit. Dumb down to her level. The fact that a four-year-old can play Mario Odyssey, to me, is yeah, well, astounding. It's, it's, I mean, she's it's clever, girl, it? it's, it's brilliant. So we have said about it being forward-thinking. Another thing that we felt was quite forward-thinking was the, the help text aspect. Now, you yeah. talked about how you, uh, in your youth, didn't have games with instruction manuals. No. So playing that would have been quite overwhelming because you wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the first things that I said to you when we booted the game, wasn't it? That actually, because Chris was talking me through a few of the aspects of the game that would have gone over my head if I was on my own playing it. Like, you can pause the menu, you can pause the game, sorry, yeah. and you've got three different That's options. Special moves. There's a, a funk scan. A panic button and, and a, a vac, vac. A vacuum. Yeah. And you, I, we won't go into where or why you might use those in the game, but you can use those. I wouldn't have known even to pause the game to find those if Chris hadn't have said. And if I had paused the game and seen them, I wouldn't necessarily have known in no, what situation. There was no context, was there? Yeah. No, not at all. So if you weren't here, this is the situation that I was in as a child. <laughs> you know, I was buying these games. They were Completely they were unboxed. Overwhelmed. Yeah, in a lot of yeah. in a lot of uh, ways. You just had to sort of feel your way through them because they didn't have boxes, they didn't have instruction manuals, literally just the cartridge. But then we realised that the bonus level was structured in that way that it just threw you in and Yeah. So there was a, a walk to the bonus level and Ashley went into it and tried it and didn't quite get what to do the first time. It chucked him out and then he then had a second time. And on the second try, kind of was able to try it a bit better and understood it a bit more. Still didn't quite make it through to the end, so it just came out a second time. He was then able to try it a third time and the third time was when obviously you were supposed to be able to complete it. Ashley didn't. It chucked him out and then that was it. Rubbish you know, again. Well, I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> That's fine. And it then chucked him out a third time and then that was it over. But we realised how it gave you that kind of hand-holding. So there was the help text for some of the game, but for some of it it was will sort of give you that help. Yeah, and, and it seems like that only... It only let me try it three times on the first level. Uh, yeah, that's the thing levels, was, uh, It didn't let yeah. me... It just let, gave me the door once and then didn't let me go back. So that was, again, fortunate. It was helpful. helpful. It was yeah. Clever. And actually, the, the bonus level wasn't hard uh, gameplay-wise. It was just that it moves very fast. And you, the, the way it is, you have to... You're running along to the right, as you often are in platform games, and you have to warp through some obstacles and collect others. So you sometimes you're warping and sometimes you're collecting. And just the speed of it was a little bit too fast for me to avoid the ones that I wasn't supposed to collect. In. But so the style I, yeah. of it was lovely. It's this sort of like it is lovely, yeah. kind of colours. It, it really reminds me of Yoshi. Vivid. Which mm. one? You know, Super Mario Land 2. Yeah. Super Mario World. Sorry. The very first Mario World, World with too. little baby Mario. Yes. Yeah, yeah. kind of similar. Yoshi's Island. It's got a pastely yeah. painted colour. Obviously, it was a little bit more bold in um, Panic on Funkatron. But it's a style in it. It works really successfully. It does, yeah. And you, you got these little glimpses of it in the non-bonus levels, in the in the main levels as well, when you threw the jars to catch the earthlings, yes. which is the main objective of the game. They sort of phase out of their Existence normal reality almost. and yeah, turn yeah. into this, like, crayony, pastely version of themselves, which is, was really nice. But... Well, that leads us nicely into we've been 
you know, wax and lyrical about the game. What did you not like about it? Because the Earthlings is something you were quite critical of during the game. It wasn't just the Earthlings. The Earthlings seem to have a, a decent amount of variety. So they all sort of have their own special move, yeah. special power. And that's great. There's a bit of variety there. But in terms of your interactions with the Earthlings, the fact the fact that you are purposefully slow in throwing the jars that you need to use to collect them, it didn't feel like an even match. It didn't feel like the game was. It didn't give you the upper hand. It gave you the. It gave them the upper hand. That was and the when you're throwing the jars, of course, you're you're kind of defenceless. So if you have yeah. more than one Earthling on screen at once, you're throwing jars at one Earthling. Another mm. Earthling could quite easily attack you, mm. which did, which is why you have those special moves there. So the, again, I won't go into them, but then, the, but then having to pause the game to access those is a little bit dis. But that's because the Mega Drive only having the limited buttons. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. So it's a way to, to shoehorn that in, I suppose. Yeah. The thing you were quite critical of was the fact that the level forced you to collect all the earthlings oh, before yeah. moving on. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, it's probably a technical limitation, the fact that you... That is, for this game, collecting the humans is the aim of, of each level. That's the plot, isn't it? Yeah. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the whole point of the game. I understand that. But you have to go... You, when, when you get to the end of a level, if you haven't collected all the humans, it sends you back back into the level again to get the ones that you've missed and it just feels in this day and age it feels a little bit strange a little bit off so I, I I just, that, and that's because we're spoiled games nowadays it's, spoiled. it's you know you, you've done a level you've not quite got all the collectibles you can go back to your main menu you can replay it games back then didn't have that luxury why I, shouldn't I, you be spoiled in that way if that is what you want to call that why would you want to gate it all off until you've done something to 100% like that. What do you mean? So I suppose I said it, it would be far more satisfying. I I have navigated that level. I've gone yeah. from the beginning of the level to the end of the level, and part of the game should, at the very least, be that traversal of the level. That should be enjoyable in itself. I'm not sure it was in Tokyo Manel, and we'll maybe come back round to that. But that's part of the le- uh, part of the game. Sorry, Toe Jam and L Two. Panic on Funkatron. A bit of criticism. Panic on Funkatron. Uh, in Panic on Funkatron, it should be that you enjoy the traversal as much as you do catching or finding and catching of the Earthlings. Yeah. Yeah. Because in truth, each level, the catching and the finding and catching, that's important, the finding and catching of the earthlings is actually a, a small amount of the time that you spend in that level. Yeah, because it's just exploring, isn't it? It's, yeah, but what's the point of the exploration if the exploration is not fun? I enjoy it, so therefore you should. What is the exploration? Explain to everybody what the exploration is in Toe on L. So you find in all your funk, you find some of the coins, you find the jars to help make it easier to get the earthlings. There was a point system, wasn't there? Like we, we spotted when you got presents, it came up saying 500 points, whatever. I'm not completely sure what the purpose of that it was. It was arbitrary, like a lot of games. Well, it maybe was continues, point. possibly. Extra lives. Mm, it didn't have three suggest lives. Yes, that. When I. That would be fairly standard, though, wouldn't it, to have an it, it was, but when I did die, I was given yeah, exit and continue. It wasn't a number. Gameplay. It wasn't. There weren't a limited number of continues. You could have just continued as the sense that. Oh, got. yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah. So you weren't, you weren't collecting up points to continue. And actually, it's not abnormal for a game of that period to just have a point system. It was. Well, it was Sonic, ubiquitous. Sonic or always had, had a that point, point system. system. It was completely. Yeah, you, you'd get hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of points to mean what? I think the points in games are for gamers that aren't us, to be honest. If you think about... Do you remember um, King of Kong? Did you see that documentary? Oh, yeah. So, King of Kong... So it stripped off him now, wasn't he? Didn't the guy that won have it taken off him? I don't know. Let's not libel anybody. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> but in King of Kong, I mean, I, I brought that up for one reason, and I'll keep it straight to the point. What it tells you is that there is such a thing as a perfect game. Yes. And we've got, oh, yeah. we've got a community of speedrunners, and they tackle a game in different ways so someone that is trying to do a perfect run of Sonic there might well be a perfect point score you know I don't know for definite it would be interesting to find out actually perfect point score for Sonic would be interesting because it would be it's the time factor into it because you get more All points of the rings. Through, but it's your rings it's also surely getting the, the bad nicks the robots as well yeah all the so, animals but if you're, animal. if you're collecting all the rings then it's going to affect your time isn't it Which yeah would then, so there must be some weighing system there something to discuss another time possibly 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 when we look at Sonic we might have to look into that 
before, but Toe Jam and Earl, there might be a similar thing. Like, there might be a perfect score. Perfect so, score for Toe Jam and Earl 2. What a thing to strive for. Did I drop Toe Jam and Earl? Did I drop the two again? Is that what you're getting at? You did. I think I was trying to get sarcastic then about Toe Jam and Earl itself. Oh, right. Okay. Is Sorry. it worth it? Is it worth it? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, again, we'll circle back around to that. You also said that the music was quite repetitive, and I do agree with that. <sighs> yeah, and, and actually, we are going to be playing a game soon. My One of my choices, uh, and I'm not saying that I'm better at choosing games or anything, but no, of course we're going to be playing a game that the music is actually one of the best things about it. Okay. Um, I think, anyway. Is it Guitar Hero? <laughs> no, oh. it's better than that. Right. Uh, it's got Calypso. Calypso music? Yeah, exactly. It's quite unusual for a game. It, it genuinely is, isn't it? Yeah. When I went back to it, I was very surprised, but that is a conversation for another time. It is, yeah. Um, but it really puts in stark contrast how repetitive yes. actually the, the noise is. The music Toe was very, it had that like hip hop influence. They do, but it was very simple. But it, you, what, exactly. I, I'll tell you what, you said hip hop, yeah. hip hop influence. If you think about some of the levels in Sonic, games and the way that the music characterizes those levels in it in a way we were talking mm-hmm. about the music in sonic and the hedgehog 3 i think and that's got little sort of hip-hop for, for reasons elements. that we couldn't possibly mention on this podcast for again fear of libel well, i don't think it's libelous to say that um <laughs> to say that <laughs> michael jackson might have been involved was almost certainly involved in we music couldn't, creation we of... couldn't possibly say why that's not libelous isn't it <laughs> the reason that he was removed the reason that they parted ways might be libelous. Yeah. Yeah, so... But the the point is, the music in, in that has hip-hop elements in it, even though the nature of a lot of game music is that it's repetitive because you've got to spend... You've got to cover a lot of time. I suppose your point is it's themed. I think that's Chemical Plants in Sonic 2 yeah. where it's that... It's very... Sort of it's, it's electric. It's iconic. Which links to level, whereas Toe Jam yeah. 2, at least levels we played, it was just it was, it was just generic music, wasn't it? It didn't lend anything to the It was it less than generic. It. it was just noise. It, yeah. And I don't mean that like your, your nana would say, turn that noise off or whatever. I mean, I mean, it was just like... Um, it got grating, didn't it? Yeah, it was too repetitive and, and it called attention to its own repetition. And I realised there might be a certain irony in this because I have said repetition about 8 million times <laughs> in, in a very short period of time. But Let's get a sin in fun, don't we? We did like... We're not sure this is a word or not. The tangibility of the levels. I think it's a word. It's a word. It's just whether it's um, relevant to what we're actually saying. It, it, whether so it's the right word. When Ashley started playing, we noticed how there were other aliens, uh, NPC characters that were walking past him. There were some birds flying in the sky. Uh, the, mm. the, the trees. I know it's an odd thing to pick up on, but the, the sprite for the trees looked really chunky and really, really nice. There was some parallax scroll in the background and it all came together to give this impression of a, a living, breathing planet almost. Yeah. There was a bit than... where you went in the water and there were fish in the background. There were fish swimming past in the foreground and they all had these really unusual. And the foliage in the water yeah, as well. It was lovely. It, was it really, really was. Really nice. You, you do see, again, you do see a lot of that on the Mega Drive and Sonic the Hedgehog games I think Sonic the Hedgehog 2 had some uh, notable uh, parallaxing Mm -hmm. I can't remember if the first one had it but even that game has some very lush looking levels yes definitely Um, and it's something that in at least in my mind and hopefully we'll get to see uh, some more examples of this the Mega Drive did that very well or the people developing the Mega Drive did it very well they really paid attention to the visuals on their games it's it's I'm hesitating when I say this because when I play SNES games, they look great. SNES, Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Yeah, Super Famicom. Super Famicom. Probably unnecessary, but never mind. Well, let's just clarify. Yeah, exactly. For the sake of people that stuck it with us for about an hour, yeah, just in case. They <laughs> so. Yeah, You get very nice looking games on the SNES, but they are very much SNES games and they look like SNES games. And then Mega Drive games do look like Mega Drive games. There's a whole family of games that we could mention that look that have a, zi- a, a similar visual style to Toe Jam and L2. Yes. And I don't mean that they've chosen to have like chunky cartoon cartoony aliens. I mean that there's a certain way that they present colours and a certain way that they animate their But characters. was that was that the zeitgeist at that time? Uh, well it was for the for the Mega Drive. To make it, it look like that. It wasn't for the SNES. And I don't know we mentioned a, a little bit earlier, unless it gets cut, the fact that there are differences in the 
hardware, what what one can put on the screen and what the other one can put. On I feel the that the Mega Drive, because it was marketed as being the more edgy, the more cool console, there must have been elements of that at play that they the games were perhaps even made differently. Start style, yes, certainly, yeah, to yeah. to tap into that. If we're going to regress back to the nineties, if we're going to be boys of five and eight in nineteen ninety three, yeah, looking at the consoles that are out at the time, the SNES and the and the Mega Drive, a quick edge. The Mega Drive was undoubtedly the cooler console. And that's why I got it, because I was the cool kid. I didn't care about those things. (laughs) (laughs) At the time, I had a NES. I actually got my first SNES in 1997. So I was way behind, because by that point... Does that mean you're so uncool that it became cool again, because you got it after it was... What I can tell you is that we were so poor that I was so cool again, or something like that. (laughs) That was the thing. I had a second-hand snares for Christmas. Um, I also want, want to point out that I was being very tongue-in-cheek there. I certainly was not cool. We are at the moment. We are, bizarrely, wearing the same top. We're very similar to Yeah, we didn't mean to do that, but it might be a uniform yeah, uh, no, for, for the politics. podcast. If you think Games Master, Games Master, go, no one's going to know what Games Master is, are they? You, if you know what Games Master is, it was br- brilliant. If you, you don't... You're not going to know what Games Master Of course people know what Games Master is. How many? Three. Yeah, exactly. That's more than two. If you, you want to know... you with those numbers. What the 90s was like, go and have a look on YouTube for Games Master. That is the 90s, or at least in game circles. And the Mega Drive is very much the, I would say, the console of Games Master. I don't know if that's factually accurate, whether they were playing the, the Mega Drive all the time, but I would put the two together. Whereas the SNES is like the console that you'd buy for the straight A student. That's quite a sweeping generalisation you've made there. I stick by it. A really heinously sweeping generalisation. Right. Just is. I, so I just don't know whether I'm basing that on the people that own SNESes. I think you probably and are. And the b- people that own Mega Drives that I knew. That SNESes are for squares and Mega Drives or Genesis is. Well, I had a SNES. And I preferred the SNES, and I still prefer the SNES. But I acknowledge that at the time, and probably even... No, I think actually it's reversed, but I think definitely at the time. And it was very opaque in the marketing for the Mega Drive, that the Mega Drive was the cooler console. Yeah, definitely. We've got some idea of what I think then, and what you think. Yeah. But is it what you remembered it to be? Yeah, it really was. I genuinely enjoyed watching you play that. So I thought it, it looked fantastic. It played like I remember it being... When we looked at the the list of levels on the inserts and it reminded me of just how vast the game is. I know I have said that already, but I just remember really enjoying it. And, and yeah, I should add that we didn't finish the game. We, no. We, we just paid. didn't have time and I wasn't good enough. There we go. I didn't have to say it. You said it yourself. You were worried though, weren't you, that it wasn't going to be what you remembered and that it wasn't going to be cool. But as we say, it was that. And I... when we say cool, we don't mean like everyone's going to look at it and go, wow, that's amazing. We mean cool for the time. Yeah. Playing it back, it in my head, I thought it was cool at the time and playing it now, it'd be a bit wince-inducing almost. Most, whereas actually it's still yeah it was fun yeah it was it was fun yeah. it looked nice it played well and what, what more can you ask for again? yeah it, it was fun it had problems and some Don't of those problems were in terms of design choices that they made how, how the game actually plays at the time I certainly know that as as a boy I would have played the heck out of that okay. and I would have come back to it you said that you came back home every day and you were oh yeah anxious to play yes. it you wanted to get on it I was and hooked I would have been the same I think and actually I probably would have enjoyed it than most of, uh, more than most of my games that I earned anyway because of what aspect more than the uh, things that we talked about the the fact that it looked so glorious I don't know how it would have looked on a 15 inch CRT television on top of my wardrobe it certainly looked nicer than most of the games that I had on the net it controlled well to be honest if if I'm going to be really honest and really shallow I think it's the fact that it looks so nice I'd keep coming back to that the gameplay just was too repetitive for me to really enjoy now and the fact that it sent me back into the level. I'll be honest, when you said about it being repetitive in terms of you, know, you chase the I'm humans. I'm looking to behind the bush. Yeah, you look behind I'm the bush. shaking that tree. It did make me think, actually, yes, I think you're right. Perhaps it is a little bit repetitive in terms of you do this, you do that, you do that. I mentioned previously about the Fungopotamuses yeah. objects. We found out... Which I didn't was, get to. No, we found out it was actually a character called Lamont and that triggered that. So there's a kind of almost a side quest to try and get these mm. these things for that. So there are things within that and you do get a wider variety of humans that do different things. So there is some uh, branching out from beyond that core game. However, I do concede that perhaps playing through a the time a fairly big game, I think, would have got a bit over the top. Yeah, but as a, as a five-year-old or an eight-year-old, as we were, that would have been... At one, it was normal. Yep. I had a game that was 100 levels long. What game was that? It was Crackout. It, it, have you had a breakout? Breakout? No. 
a brick breaking game. Was that the, game. One of the little thing at the, the bottom of the balls? Paddle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The balls. It was one. It was that. It was hundred levels long. Right. And I, I think I only got to the end once. Right. Like, we'll talk about it again. Yeah. At some point, but it was hundred levels long, and I persisted with that for years. Um, it was good. I actually, it was yeah, really I good game, that game. But I would play the levels over and over and over again. Um, so it's not like it's not like Panic on Funkatron yeah. was abnormal in that respect. I prefer it now. I prefer the way things are now. Is the lack of repetition in games that sure? a good thing. Yes, certainly. Yeah, so we're not spoiled. That's not an aspect of being spoiled, is it, that they've removed that I think it's game. branched out somewhat. There's more mm. variety, variety. and They look for that, don't they? they? They are looking to make sure things don't get too repetitive. If we think about open world games or, or anything like that, the fetch quest is the perfect example. I mean, maybe it has gone a bit the other way in terms of cramming too much content yeah. in, possibly. Um, y- yes and no. If you look at Mario Odyssey, which is one of my favourite games ever, I think, actually. I think there's... Is there 800? Unique. Was it 890? Or 880? 880. Yeah, there's there 890. are a lot. <laughs> there's a lot, yeah. <laughs> there are hundreds of moons, and I just found joy in almost every one. Yes. I think. Apart from the... For me, I got 879 of them myself. I had to get Ashley to do the 880th, which was... Yeah, the... that wasn't anything to do with the game, though. Was it? That was that was the the jump rope challenge in New Dong City. Yeah, and that was because the it was because of Tally. Yeah, it wasn't. If you'd done it in handheld, yeah, because you did it straight away in handheld, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, it was because the time on your Tally was off. Yeah, possibly. But you knew that anyway because yeah. Guitar Hero. Yeah. So you, I don't know why you spent months trying to do that. In retrospect, no, that's quite a foolish thing, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, there's 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 um, variety there, and it's a lot of a lot of variety. Um, and then you get something like the new Assassin's Creed games. I'm playing Origins at the moment, and it's got a lot of variety. The world is brilliant, um, but equally, it feels at times a little bit too big, a little bit too abundant with things to do. So, a couple of questions then, just to wrap things up. Would you buy that for yourself as a boy, and would you buy that now for yourself now? Myself as a boy, what if I could travel through time, like Ghost of Christmas Future? Yeah. Materialise in my eight year old self's bedroom and. Maybe don't do it like that. Maybe just buy it. It opens up a whole realm of questions, doesn't it? (laughs) Uh, I think yes to both questions. I would, I would genuinely play that now. I played it, like I said earlier, I played it when I was at university when I was about 19 and I really enjoyed it then. I think I would still enjoy playing the full game now. It just, and I know it's shallow to say and you have already said it, it just looks nice, doesn't it? It does look look nice. nice. Yeah. While you can get games that look nice and play terribly, this looked nice and seemed to still play well, Mm. which 26 years on is quite a feat, really. Mm. Yeah, I I think I, I don't think I would buy it now. Why not? I'd buy it for me then. Right. For definite. But now you don't. But I wouldn't play that game because there's 18 levels of that. I I think it would just be too much of a grind to get through the whole thing. I would play a modernised version of it. So the fact that there's the new version sequel, is it? I think so, yeah. Essentially the fourth game, I should think, in the series. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, The fact that that's there. mm, Playing this one has made me more interested in maybe having Mm. a look at that one. Yes, me too. Because you will benefit from the the advancements of, of modern gaming. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That you say make us spoil. I'd be interested to see what, what those into the Earthlings to make it modernised. Because uh, some of those, we talked about how two of the Earthlings were tourists. There was a, a male and female tourist who blind Tojam or Earl using their cameras with a flash. And Presumably that, phones. Uh, yeah, possibly phones. Using phones. I don't know. Maybe they just have wholly different tourists or maybe they've gone in a totally different direction with the game. I don't maybe. know. We should have a look. We, we should, should do. Okay. Should we wrap that up there? I think that is a wrap. Okay, well, thank you for playing, Ashley. Thank you for what? Well, thank you for playing, comma, Ashley. Not thank you for playing, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs>《This Game Wear is a Specky Two Guys production. Music for the episode is provided under Creative Commons license by Stevia Sphere from the album Cell Division, which can be found at steviasphere.bandcamp.com. 